Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behavior is how the other captives reacted to it, or rather didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces, and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering into the microphones. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. On February 1, 1986, actress Heather O'Rourke, who co-starred in the original 1982 Poltergeist film as well as two sequels, died at the age of 12 in San Diego. Her death has become a part of what many believe is an eerie series of deaths connected to the films. Poltergeist, directed by Toby Hooper and produced by Steven Spielberg, was a blockbuster hit when it was released in 1982 and is considered a horror classic today. The film was so successful that it spawned two sequels, Poltergeist 2 – The Other Side in 1986 and Poltergeist 3 in 1988. One of the creepy elements of the films is that they are shrouded in real-life tragedies that some interpret as a curse. The alleged curse was spawned by the deaths of multiple cast members. In total, four cast members died during and soon after the filming of the series. Two of these tragic deaths were highly unexpected and puzzling, leading many fans to speculate about a possible curse. Carol Ann Freeling, the young focal point of the series, was played by Heather O'Rourke. Only six years old when the first film was released, O'Rourke she won over audiences with her blonde hair, doll-like appearance, and big eyes. Sadly, however, she was misdiagnosed with Crohn's disease in 1987. The following year, O'Rourke fell ill again, and her symptoms were casually attributed to the flu. A day later, she collapsed and suffered cardiac arrest. After being airlifted to a children's hospital in San Diego, O'Rourke died during an operation to correct a bowel obstruction, and it was later believed that she'd been suffering from a congenital intestinal abnormality. Dominique Dunn, who played the original older sister, Dana Freeling, met an equally tragic and unforeseen fate. 
In 1982, Dunn separated from her partner, John Sweeney. In November of that year, he showed up at Dunn's house pleading for her to take him back. When she refused, Sweeney choked her until she was unconscious and left her to die in the driveway of her Hollywood home. For whatever reason, Sweeney only served three years and seven months of his prison sentence. The other two cast members' deaths, while unfortunate, were not as unpredictable. The evil and very scary preacher Kane from Poltergeist 2 was played by Julian Beck. In 1983, Beck had been diagnosed with stomach cancer, and he died soon after he finished work on the second installment of the series. The same film was met with further tragedy. After Will Sampson, who played Taylor, the Native American shaman, died after undergoing a heart-lung transplant, which had a very slim survival rate. Cast deaths were not the only creepy elements of the curse. There are some strange stories connected to the film that have never been explained. Jo Beth Williams, who played mom Diane Freeling in the first two films, claimed that Steven Spielberg insisted on using actual human skeletons as props in an attempt to save money. At the time, they were cheaper than plastic skeletons. Williams' claim has never been verified, but it persists to this day in the lore surrounding the film's curse. Finally, to further creep out everyone involved, Will Sampson, a real-life medicine man who passed away after the second film, performed a ritual cleansing on the set after shooting wrapped up one night. Was there a curse? Or was there simply a number of odd coincidences that happened in the wake of the making of the three films? You'll have to decide for yourself. Prince George's County is about 500 square miles of green fields dotted with suburbs located just outside Washington, D.C. in Maryland. Its less than a million inhabitants enjoy nature preserves, historic reenactments, and an annual blues festival and a sparkling waterfront development on the Potomac. In other words, it's fairly bucolic. And of course, beneath the surface of every bucolic locale roils something dark and fierce. Meet the Goatman. When scared teenagers whisper about Goatman, not all agree on the form he takes. Some say he was a man who kept goats and went mad after teenagers killed his flock, driven to seek revenge against any youngster. But perhaps the most titillating version traces the origin of Goatman to the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, a sprawling USDA facility anchored by a big brick building appointed with white columns. In this version, a mad scientist is conducting experiments on a goat when something goes horribly wrong, turning him into a half-man, half-goat beast that is naturally hungry for blood. He may not be as famous as his cryptid cousins Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, but Goatman has a devoted following. He's inspired a horror movie called Deadly Detour. They went with the Goatman as human version due to budgetary constraints, according to director Mike Amahoney, and a Halloween attraction. He's paid lip service in the classic coming-of-age movie American Graffiti. When editing the illustrated Fantagraphics tome Beasts, Jacob Covey said he received more Goatman entries than he could include. The stories began surfacing a long, long, long time ago, according to Dr. Barry Pearson, a folklorist at the University of Maryland, which happens to be in Prince George's County and is home to a Goatman archive. But the stories really kick into high gear around the 50s and 60s, with the goat man having his heyday in the 70s, probably because of the dead dog. In 1971, a puppy named Ginger met a grisly end in the city of Bowie. 
Reporter Ivan Goldberg covered the incident for the Washington Post, writing, Ginger, a sprightly mongrel who resembled a German shepherd, has been decapitated cleanly at the neck. The body is not found. Goldman's story suggested that perhaps the dog had been hit by a train, its head separated from its body and launched into the air. Locals quoted in the story fingered the marauding goat man. According to Pearson, when it comes to folklore and urban legends, I hate that term because these stories almost always take place somewhere out in the woods, there's always a keeper who passes the story on from one generation to the next. In this case, the keepers are bored teenagers with time to kill who go on what folklorists call a legend trip to ferret out the goat man. You have to figure out what teenagers have going for them, says Pearson. Today, they have the mobility of the automobile and rampant hormones, so they're always off to Lover's Lane. Goatman is also purported to frequent Lover's Lanes, although he's typically mauling a teenager's car with a rock or axe instead of pursuing romance. He's also often spotted near Fletchertown Road and Lotsford Road in Prince George's County. Both stretches were once winding and dark, but are now bustling thoroughfares, whizzing past malls and tidy two-story houses, not really the stuff of nightmares, unless one is especially sensitive to the homogenization of the American landscape. Some might wonder why a goat lies at the center of this horrifying legend. This reporter, for instance, who devolves into a baby talk whenever a goat is near. Why not say an animal that can actually kill you? If you look at some of the other versions of the goat man that are half man and half goat, there are a few that stand out, says Pearson. The satyr in Greco-Roman times was the kind of keeper of the woodlands, drunk all the time and known mainly for being lustful. Employing a bit of folkloric humor, Pearson adds, I mean, talk about being horny. Examples of libidinous and violent goats abound. There was a cult in Roman times, for instance, that worshipped Dionysus and was led by a man dressed as a goat. They were rumored to get very drunk, go into a frenzy and tear animals apart and eat them raw. Pearson is quick to point out this probably never happened. Witches were often depicted in the company of Satan, represented as a half-man, half-goat. In medieval times, goats were thought of as being exceptionally lascivious. Picky, dark age types even took issue with their eyes because of their leering look, the lecherous look of the beast. Goatman may be all fun and games for Maryland teens, but there is one player in the story who is not amused – the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center. We just think it's stupid, says Kim Kaplan, spokesperson for the center. Maybe it's sort of fun, just a little bit to be a part of local legend. People really don't even talk about him, says Kaplan. I mean, it's so silly, it's not even something that's joked about. Kaplan was also quick to poke holes in the Goatman story. Don't you think he would have retired by now? She asked. Is his great-grandson a Goatman? Is he collecting Social Security? Kaplan could not even recall when there were last goats at the center, although she surmised it had been generations ago. In fact, the center is mostly devoted to records and genetics. They have, for instance, kept elaborate mathematical records pertaining to what bull sperm helps produce the best milk cows. Even if the goat man is not beloved by the center, he doesn't seem to be going anywhere soon. As long as teenagers need an excuse to be alone in the woods together, Goatman lurks nearby, one in a long chain of sinister ruminants. Tell people to be careful, Pearson says, offering a parting bit of sardonic advice, and don't turn their back on the cute little goat. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? 
The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. Leprechauns are mainly found in Irish folklore. Its name is derived from the Gaelic meaning pygmy, or maker of one shoe. Many myths and legends of leprechauns, also known as we folk, are centuries old. These stories have been passed down from one generation to another, and children in Ireland are taught the folklore stories of mysterious leprechaun creatures from a very early age. The leprechaun's appearance varied much depending on where in Ireland he was found. Usually, he takes the form of an old man, about two to three feet tall, clad in a green or red coat, buckled shoes and hats, who enjoys participating in mischief. This magical figure plays several roles in Irish folklore. He is a most untrustworthy trickster that deceives whenever possible but sometimes the leprechaun is only a playful, intelligent creature, generally harmless even if credited with the odd small tricks on farmers and location villagers. When a ladder falls over, a toe is stubbed, or another unlucky event occurs, it is certainly the fault of the leprechaun. The magical power given to him by the Irish fairies the leprechaun uses if ever captured by a human or an animal or to protect his pot of gold hidden deep in the Irish countryside. The leprechaun are known to successfully evade capture from humans. If ever captured by a human, the leprechaun has the magical power to grant three wishes in exchange for their release. In the Irish folklore, leprechauns are known to be the only fairy that has a business, which is shoemaking. Therefore, they are often called fairy cobblers, for they make shoes for elves, but unfortunately only one shoe, never a pair. It's not easy to find the leprechauns. They live underground in a large network of caves. It's the only safe place too small for humans and hidden from any dangers found above the ground. The entrance of caves can be found masked as rabbit holes, or can be found in a shallow trunk of a fairy tree. The fairy trees are protected by magic, and if any human damages one, a lifetime of bad luck will occur. I have been obsessed with mysterious vanishings my entire life. How do people simply walk away one day, never to be seen again? It's a question that I often ask myself when I stumble across mysteries like the one that began plaguing El Paso, Texas in 1957. On the evening of March 5th, William and Margaret Patterson left their home at 3000 Piedmont Drive and vanished without a trace. 
leaving everything they owned behind. To this day, their disappearance has never been solved. Although many have tried, suggesting that they were Russian spies or were abducted by aliens. William and Margaret Patterson were an ordinary people. They owned Patterson Photo Supply in town and were well liked by their customers, friends, and neighbors. In addition to their business, they also owned a Cadillac, a boat, stock in a boat company, and property in Mexico. They lived a quiet life and no one had ever noticed anything unusual about them. A few nights before their disappearance, the Pattersons invited another couple, the Wards, owner of the Ward Motor Clinic, over for dinner. After the meal, Cecil Ward and William went out to the garage to have a beer and apply some acrylic to William's boat. The Wards later told the police that neither of the Pattersons mentioned any plans to travel. In fact, Cecil added that he and William had plans to get together later in the week. On the morning of March 6, 1957, Cecil opened his auto business and discovered that William Patterson's Cadillac was sitting in the driveway. A man named Doyle Kirkland came into the auto shop a few minutes later. Kirkland managed Duffy Photo Service, and though he and William had competing businesses, they were good friends. When asked why he had the Patterson's car, Kirkland brushed it off. He told Cecil that he and William had worked on his boat the previous night and that the Pattersons were going on a little vacation. He claimed that William had asked Kirkland to bring the car to Cecil for a tune-up. But something didn't sit right about the story for Cecil. He called the police. When they arrived at the Patterson house, it was eerily silent. Dishes from the previous night's meal were still in the sink. The newspaper was on the front steps. Mail was in the box. Nothing had been packed. Suitcases were still in the closet. Detectives later learned that clothing, including an expensive fur coat, had been left at the cleaners waiting to be picked up. None of the utilities had been disconnected and the newspaper and mail were still scheduled for delivery. Only the family cat, Tommy, stirred in the house and no extra food or water had been left for him. Margaret would have never gone out of town without arranging for the cat's care. Cecil Ward cooperated fully with the police. He told them everything he knew about the Pattersons. He described William as a boisterous, free-spending but kind man, but he had his faults. Ward recalled that a month earlier William had gotten drunk in Juarez, Mexico and picked a fight with a waiter. Turned out that William had been in town with his 20-year-old mistress, Estefana Arroyo Morphin, and the waiter refused to serve her. Of course, this led to more questions about the Patterson's lifestyle, and Cecil suddenly realized how little he really knew. Both Margaret and William had been tight-lipped about their respective childhoods, except to say that it had been rough. William was from Chicago and had worked in traveling carnivals. Margaret's parents had not approved of him and demanded that Margaret choose between her family and William. Later, Margaret's friends told investigators that she never told them her birth date, exactly how she and William had met, or how long they'd been married. Everyone seemed to like the couple, but they really knew very little about them. To add to the mystery, William's father, Luther Patterson, said he had always expected William and Margaret to disappear one day, because his son had the free-spirited heart of a carny. Luther added that he was certain that the couple was not dead and that William had done things like that before. William's mistress, Estefana, was also questioned and told detectives that William had recently told her that he needed to disappear soon and do it quickly. She later retracted that statement, however. The investigation stalled, and then, on March 15th, Herbert Roth, the Patterson's accountant, received a telegram. It was sent from the Western Union office in Dallas, where it had been placed from a telephone call near the Love Field Airport. 
the sender was listed as W. H. Patterson, which was odd since William's middle name was Durrell. The telegram instructed Roth to act as business manager of the Patterson Photo Supply Company. It also asked him to sell a mobile home that was owned by the Pattersons, use the proceeds of the sale to support the store, and rent out the Pattersons' home for the next nine months. And there was one last note. It instructed Roth to hire a new store manager to replace William at the photo company, Doyle Kirkland. The telegram seemed to be a new lead, but it deepened the mystery. It had been called in by telephone, which meant that no handwritten original existed. In other words, anyone at all could have placed the call to Western Union. And while the telegram's odd requests certainly cast suspicion on Doyle Kirkland, no further evidence linked him to the Patterson's disappearance. By the 1960s, Kirkland had left El Paso for parts unknown. The police were unable to trace him. As time passed, there were regular sightings of the Pattersons. Several people claimed to spot them outside of Mexico City years after they vanished. Sheriff Bob Bailey tracked down some hotel workers in Val de Bravo, and after showing them some photographs, they identified the Pattersons as a couple who had stayed with them for several months in 1957. However, no hotel records or signatures in the guest book could be linked to the Pattersons. William and Margaret Patterson were officially declared dead on March 27, 1964. The case was cold and stayed that way for the next 20 years. In 1984, though, a man named Reynaldo Nonagre came forward with new, startling information. Nonagre had been the caretaker at the Patterson's house, and he told a detective that he had found blood in the garage and a piece of human scalp on the propeller of the Patterson's boat shortly after the couple disappeared. He admitted to having cleaned up at the scene. He also claimed he had seen a man carrying bloody sheets out of the house and throwing them into the trunk of a car. He had not gotten a clear look at the man, but it was not William Patterson. When asked why he waited so long to come forward, Nangare said that he had been an undocumented immigrant in 1957 and feared being deported. Two years after coming forward, Nangare was killed in an auto accident none of his information was ever confirmed. There are many theories about what happened to the Pattersons. Some believe they were murdered, although there is no explanation for why police found no trace of the blood that Nangare described, and others think they were kidnapped. Some feel that the couple went on the run for some reason, or that one of the other of them did after killing their spouse. Some have pointed fingers at Doyle Kirkland, the only person who seemed to profit from their vanishing. Some even believe they may have been abducted by aliens, although evidence for that seems to be a bit hard to find as well. One of the most intriguing theories about the Pattersons is that they disappeared because they had been ordered to do so, because they were Russian spies. This theory gained attention in 2009 when El Paso County Sheriff Leo Samaniego was interviewed for a retrospective about the lingering case. He told reporter Diana Washington Valdez that he believed the Pattersons had been spies because of how quickly they vanished. The photo supply company had been a cover, he theorized, so that William Patterson could get photographs of nearby Fort Bliss and of military shipments that came in and out by train there was no evidence to confirm this theory either, but it is a compelling one. In the end, we'll never know what happened to William and Margaret Patterson. Their case remains just as mysterious now as it was 60 years ago. Murder? Kidnapping? Aliens? Spies? We'll never know for sure, but the story will remain just as compelling now as it was six decades ago especially for the people of El Paso.
In 2025, neutron bombs wipe out much of the world's drinkable water. For the next several years, survivors exist in deplorable conditions and their rations are dwindling. One woman arises from the camp, determined to improve conditions. Charlotte is ready to do whatever it takes to ensure clean water for her fellow survivors. Water is almighty. Whoever controls the water rules the world. Can Charlotte prevent the power from falling into the wrong hands? Weird Darkness Publishing presents Working for H2O by Sarah Faith. Now available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions on Amazon and at WeirdDarkness.com. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed-circuit cameras, so they had only microphones and five-inch thick glass porthole-sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on but no bedding, running water and toilet, and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained having been promised, falsely, that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past, and the general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the four-day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternately whispering to the microphones and one-way mirrored portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behavior is how the other captives reacted to it, or rather didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces, and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering into the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working, since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming with five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice response. We no longer want to be freed. 
debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air, and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging as if pleading for the life of their loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them in was life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects' thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed. While the heart, lungs, and diaphragm remained in place, the skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives if you count ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than ten times the human dose of a morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. His heart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he bled out to the point there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeating the word more over and over, weaker and weaker until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility, the two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four-inch wide leather strap on one wrist, 
even through the weight of a 200-pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had triple the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed, he was unable to beg or object to surgery, and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head, yes, when someone suggested reluctantly they try the surgery without anesthetic, and did not react for the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it shouldn't be medically possible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well. Although they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation, the surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed, the subjects could only follow the attending researcher with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asked for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped out their own guts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced, and they were placed back into the chamber awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers, facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project, considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer and ex-KGB instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might, first left, then right, then left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and was blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brain waves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to that of deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. 
His brain waves showed the same flat lines as one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside as well as three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point-blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things, not with you, he screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you? he demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? the subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread." The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out, so nearly free. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>